My name is Jane Toomey. I'm one of the full-time faculty member here in the communication program. So I want to just put in a little bit of a, of a pitch for our program. Uh, the roundtable is hosted by the master's program in communication. And we have a very, as the students will tell you, rigorous program here, a very good program uh, with concentrations in digital media, political media, health communication, and corporate nonprofit. So we have information outside. If you're not a student and you'd like information, please pick some up on the way out. We also have a sign-up sheet if you'd like to be in our listserv so you'll get information about um, some of our events that come up. We hold events every semester, including the summer. So, um, you know, you can be we can put you on our, our listserv and you can find out about all of the wonderful events that will be coming. Um, this evening I'm very delighted to have an excellent panel to talk about public opinion, uh, the media, and the American voter. Um, and so let me introduce our esteemed panel and we'll start with some questions. Usually what we do is I'll start with some questions to the panel. I'll let the panel answer as, as they feel fit. And then after I exhaust all of my questions, uh, we'll go out to the audience and see what questions you have for our panel as well. Um, when you do come up uh, to ask your questions, I'll have the microphone. So if you could just be as concise as you can be so we can get everybody in, I'd appreciate it. All right, Immediate meet, immediately to my left is Sam Rogers. Um, Sam is currently the communications director at Zogby International and a former international analyst and writer. Um, he's worked for Zogby since 2006, and he received both his undergraduate degree and master's in public administration from the University of Georgia. Okay, and next to him is John Cohen. Some of you might recognize the name. Um, John Cohen has been the director of polling at the Washington Post since 2006. Prior to joining the Post, he was an assistant director of the ABC News polling unit. And before ABC, he helped run surveys for the Policy Institute of California. And he is a graduate of Johns Hopkins, but not our program, but that's okay. <laughs> Welcome back anyway. <laughs> All right. um, sitting next to John is Mark Blumenthal. Um, Mark has been in political polling for probably more than 20 years. Um, he is the editor and publisher of, is that, is that right? No, that's right. Okay. I started when I was 11. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he knew what he wanted to do early. <laughs> He's the editor and publisher of pollster.com, and that's the website that pol publishes poll results and a daily commentary on political polling. And if you haven't visited the site, it's really very interesting. Zogby also has a site that's very interesting. Uh, Mark is also a polling analyst for the National Journal, where he writes a weekly column for the nationaljournal.com. He's very into .com stuff. Okay, and uh, our last person on the table, last but not least, is Paul Waldman. Paul is a partner in R5 Advices, and that's a communication consulting firm, and he's a senior correspondent with the American Prospect magazine. Um, prior to joining R5 Advisors, uh, Mark was the director of special projects at the Media Matters for America and the Associate Director of the Annenberg Public Policy Center. And Annenberg does a lot of polling and a lot of political work as well. And he supervised a number of large projects there. So he has a, a wonderful background as well. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, uh, to talk about this evening was whether or not there really is a public opinion in America. Um, much of the work that we do when we study media effects looks at, uh, those of you who have taken the media effects class, looks at things like, um, cultivation and framing and agenda setting. And that was always based on the assumption that media had an effect on public opinion. That goes back to Lippmann in the 1920s. Um, and that it helped us form our opinions about, about issues and politicians and events. Um, but today, it seems like we're in a rather hyper-fractious type of society. And so I'm not sure if there is a public opinion anymore. So I wanted to start by asking our panel if there is still a public opinion. And if there is, what is public about it? So who wants to dive in? <laughs> um, all right, I'll, I'll start just briefly. I, you know, I think that the there, there's always been a lot of different conceptions about what the public really was. Um, and despite all of these sort of recent changes in communication technology that have all kinds of an effect, effects on what we think of as the public, um, that doesn't mean that, uh, that it's necessarily uh, sort of the first time that we, that the public has been transformed in this way or that we should understand it in a completely new way. I mean, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you uh, look, you, know, you mentioned Lippmann, if you go back and look at all of these different kind of conceptions of what the public was, uh, there were always a lot of sort of competing ideas about what 
what the public was, what what really opinion is, you know, is that uh, is the public the people who are actually involved and have opinions, um, or uh, is the public sort of something that that kind of exists out there um, uh, that 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 includes everybody? Um, so uh, you know, there there the the latest sort of shifts in communication technology that that give us this different kind of w- kinds of ways of looking at the public don't necessarily mean that uh, that the public itself is different because you know it's always important for those of us who live in this town and who are consumed by politics to keep in mind that for most people um, or at least for a lot of people if, even if it's not most uh, things haven't you know really transformed for them in recent years you know the, the news is still something that they that they watch out of the corner of their eye when they're uh, when they're making dinner for their kids you know most the the, the number one uh, source of information for people is still local television news uh, which is you know the least helpful uh, for any kind of conception of democracy you might have um, so uh, so I think we, we always have to be careful about saying that the public is completely different now um, and ask, you know, who are we really including in that? Uh, it's very different uh, for a lot of people, uh, but it hasn't changed much for many people. Um, back when I was an undergraduate, when I was 10, um, uh, I think we started, there was a, one of my favorite classes uh, started with a discussion like this. And the professor cited an answer to this question, which I think, uh, which is now 50 years old. It's famous. Uh, v.O. Key, the, the famous political scientist who studied, among other things, politics in the South, um, had this wonderful quote that I've used in columns. And I went back to it today, and it, it sort of, it, it almost as if, as if he were hearing your question, because he, he wrote in uh, Public Opinion in American Democracy in 1960. For purposes of political analysis, we need not strain painfully toward the formation of a theoretical representation of an eerie entity called public opinion. Public opinion in this discussion may simply be taken to mean those opinions held by private persons which governments find it prudent to heed. Think about what follows in the context of health care, the health care debate, or immigration, or any of the other questions you're probably going to ask us today. Governments may be compelled toward action or inaction by such opinion. In other instances, they may ignore it, or perhaps at their peril, they may attempt to alter it, or they may divert or pacify it. So defined, opinion may be shared by many or few. It may be the various whim, or it may be settled conviction. It may represent general agreement formed after the widest discussion. It may be far less firmly founded. I won't, I'll stop reading now. But. Uh, you know, I, I just don't think there ever was a singular public opinion. I think the notion of public opinion that we all sort of agree on is is what uh, Key defined, which is many opinions, many publics. I, mean, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, there's there's no unquestionably an authentic public opinion out there. It's not a singular one, but people know how to lead their lives very well. They generally make good decisions for themselves. They don't use the wonky words that many of us here on uh, Massachusetts Avenue uh, might on any given day. But you know, the, if you attend any focus groups, many people here in Washington will dismiss those as you know people who are easily misled by 30 second spots or whatever. But I've never left a focus group and hard, rarely um, conducted a poll. I didn't leave feeling better about the American public and the decisions that they are capable of making on you know issues that are sometimes simple but sometimes very complex and whether they're making informed decisions or just going on gut or you know public feel or their political sense and sensibilities I, I, I mean I'm, I'm impressed and I think it you know it's genuine there are lots of things that you know kind of um, there are lots of unseen forces and some seen ones that we can talk about um, I'm here so you can bash the mainstream media um, <laughs> among other things um, and you know th- th- there are lots of you know complex things or lots of interesting questions but there's unquestionably something that you know is real that we are trying to measure, and that's our real problem: is, is measuring it and 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 thinking when we measure it that we've come up with something, you know, kind of you know undeniable and true. And you know, we as analysts, we have to recognize that you know, no matter how good our measure, and some of us measure things better than others, um, in the present company <laughs> included, um, not included in that statement. Um, 
you know, th that, you know, kind of we have to recognize that it's, it's partial evidence, you know, no matter what we find and that there are, you know, biases everywhere. And it's, you know, Mark has written a lot about this, but it's the accumulation of, you know, different questions asked different ways over different subjects that ultimately leads to an understanding of um, public opinion, which is very real, um, but complex. I would say I, I generally agree with, uh, with everything there, so I'll just briefly build on that and say that um, I think it, when you look at it historically, you look back and you want to see or you want to believe that there was more consensus then than there was now. Um, and I think that was probably only the case because it's something we'll, I'm sure, talk about later. The Internet's just given, uh, opened a door or a window, rather, for groups and, and individuals on the further sides of the debate to have a voice. And sometimes that voice is disproportionate to their size or their strength, and so it makes it seem like it, currently it might be more contentious than it is in actuality. But uh, I would agree there's no one public opinion, but, um, but that it does appear more fractured than, than it once did. Okay, I think that we we tend to think of, of some sort of public opinion, and what I'm hearing now is that you think it's fractured. So another assumption that I think we've had over the years, and I know we talk about it with our students, is that there was a unified landscape in the media, uh, or you know there there was some sort of elite media that affected public opinion or affected the way that people think. And I'm curious as to what you think about that landscape now, how it's changed, because I know you were talking about how we used to think about public opinion. So how has the media, the media's effect on public opinion changed? I mean, was it ever as strong as we thought it was? Or is it just the landscape has changed now and it's much different? Can I, uh, let me, can I start on, on sort of the first part of your question, which is, uh, is, it more, is the media more fractious now than it was? It's different. Um, there, there's a, and I will, I'm sure everyone here will talk about it, and, and we may you know, we have another round on this, but I don't agree that there was sort of a single mass media that everyone consumed data from. I got done transcribing this little paragraph, and I flipped through this book I've had for a while, and there in 1960 was key looking at data from the uh, surveys conducted by the University of Michigan in the 1950s that had media use questions, one of which was, uh, where do you get your information about the campaign? And in 1956, okay, think Mad Men, right? 1956, uh, it's, uh, television had leapt to 74% who said they got information from that. It was a 25 point gain over four years. Um, newspapers were still at 69, radio at 45, magazines at 31. Um, and so Key came to the conclusion that there wasn't one media, there were lots of media. There were some people who, magazine readers, uh, who, you know, 5% who said they got most of their information from magazines were highly, highly informed and motivated and likely to turn out. While on the other extreme, there were those who were paying no attention at all or getting their information from television who were far more disconnected. You see the same kinds of patterns now. They're just different media. And, and the, the nature of those media are a little different. But I think the notion that there was sort of one big mass audience and now there are lots of little audiences, that's probably true for network news, but beyond that, um, I'm not sure it is. I'm kind of curious what everybody else thinks about that because all of the media that Mark mentioned were, were, gate, were what we would call gatekeeper media. There, there were journalists, journalists were working there and they, they served as gatekeepers. And much of the media that's on the internet now is not gatekeeper media. It's media by individuals who aren't necessarily edited, who don't necessarily check, check facts. And so I'm wondering how that change has affected the way that Americans think about politics, about each other. I think that's true in some senses and not and less true in others. I mean, if you look at what are the most trafficked online websites, they are uh, websites that are associated with mainstream media news organizations um, like CNN and New York Times. Um, <clears throat> and the the real sort of free for all is happening uh, with a much smaller audience than those places that still have um, that are associated with those kind of old line organizations. Um, at the same time, though, uh, you know, the, the Pew Research Center did an interesting survey a few weeks ago. Uh, they found that 37 percent of people, I think, said that they had done something sort of participatory with the media, like posted a comment onto, uh, onto a news story or, you know, put up a news story on their Facebook page, things like that. So you're getting these kinds of new ways of interacting with it. Um, 
uh, and at the same time, there's still a hierarchy when it comes to how the political world deals with things. I mean, uh, you know, the New York Times is still the most important news outlet um, in America and maybe even in the world, even though, you know, supposedly it comes from this dying medium. Look, those are fighting words. <laughs> um, uh, and in, in terms of who's setting the agenda for the rest of the news media and who other journalists look to for validation on what's an important story and what isn't an important story, um, you know, the Times is still, I mean, you can still watch the network evening news on, at 6.30 with a copy of the New York Times in your hand, and every single story will be something that was on the front page of the Times that day. Um, so uh, so you still have that that kind of hierarchy, and they and those mainstream, you know, what Sarah Palin calls the lamestream media, uh, they still they still set a lot of the agenda for the blogs and for those kinds of, um, those more um, interactive, uh, you know, reader-driven kinds of outlets that then take it in all kinds of interesting directions. Um, but there still is this this very large importance of uh, of those kinds of key organizations. Now, it's not the same as when, you know, Walter Cronkite would say, and that's the way it is, and it, and it was, and that was it, and there was no more discussion about it. Um, but, uh, but, you know, the old media hasn't died yet, which I'm sure John is happy to hear. <laughs> Not, not yet. <laughs> Sometimes, um, not yet. But it, I mean, it's changed dramatically, and and you know, our role as gatekeepers, I mean, just talking about polls and public opinions, has changed enormously just in the time you know that I've been at the Washington Post. You know, in two thousand six, since two thousand six, and before that at ABC News. You know, you know when we you know we have certain standards that are based on you know a polls methodology, and we only cover we cover some polls and not others. And you know, there are lots of blogs out there who you know and mainstream other mainstream newspapers and other media organizations who um, don't have those same standards. And so uh, we're not playing that gatekeeper role. We are for, you know, the dwindling number who get our paper newspaper. But, you know, those who have, you know, kind of the alternative to go online and find it, they'll go out and find a poll that, you know, meets, you know, either is more interesting to them in the moment or, you know, kind of is in line with their own political views. And I think that's, you know, one of the more interesting things to discuss in terms of the, you know, the proliferation of media, you know, leave aside the proliferation of polls for a moment, but the proliferation of media is, you know, people increasingly can turn to whatever they feel, you know, like reading or, you know, kind of you know, um, meets their own viewpoints on various issues. And so that, that I think that has implications um, for us politically um, and as a society when you can have, you know, not all everyone turning into Walter Cronkite or other people. And I think we're just beginning to see the effects of that. You know, there there are these polls, the NBC Wall Street Journal poll um, recently asked, you know, kind of what, what cable television television network or what television network most people got their news from. Now, you know, Fox News viewers are dramatically different from CNN and MSNBC viewers. Now, a lot of that is, you know, kind of the self-selection that goes into that. You know, you have conservative Republicans who only watch Fox and liberal Democrats who only watch CNN and MSNBC. So I'm not saying it's because of the media, but you have this, you know, kind of this delineation that's stronger in terms of the information that people are exposing themselves to and you know, receive. And I think that has implications in terms of you know, the messages that get out there and the um, implications of those messages and in some cases misinformation that gets out there about whether it's public opinion or, you know, kind of facts on the ground. And those can have an impact. And I would add on that, um, I think when I was referring to the fact that the media used to be or that we looked back and saw more of a consensus. Um, stems from the fact that, I mean, the, the media was obviously different. There were, there, were, there were divergent voices, but the power was held in the hands of a very small number of individuals. You know, John Kennedy could call up the editor of Time and squash a story um, about Cuba um, in a two minute phone call. That can't happen today. I mean, it could happen. It happened at the New York Times but, um, and the lead up to the Iraq war. But it's much harder, um, and with these blogs, even though they might not be the main source of traffic, if the Drudge Report puts something up, um, it will be on Fox News later. And if it gets on Fox News for a couple of hours, CNN's gonna pick it up, and then once that ball starts going, uh, everyone else is in trying to play catch up. And I think what that does is, is it implies to, applies to polling, is it opens the door for outliers to enter into the system uh, much easier. Um, you know, our own polls, uh, other polls, uh, new polling groups that just pop up on the scene, you know, if they give their material to say the Drudge Report or Raw Story or Media Matters or whoever it may be, um, it's much easier for them to 
to get that entered into the conversation without you know a lot of background work and intensive building that would have had to have happened 30 40 years ago when it was just Gallup or uh, you know well really just Gallup I guess 40 years ago I'm, I'm kind of curious as to what you think about the blog environment and the degree to which people, the marketplace of ideas is either broadened or lessened by that. You know, it, uh, we, we were talking before the panel about the very fractious nature of politics these days and the very partisan nature of politics. And I'm wondering, has it always, are, are we kidding ourselves in thinking that it was never this way before or has this proliferation of media on the internet and a, a, an audience's ability to choose to go to these, you know, to the poll of your choice, I and mean, you can go online and there's a bazillion polls you can look at for any election. Has that done damage to, to the notion of citizenship in this country, to the form, formation of public opinions that will help people decide things like voting and how they should feel about issues? Um, I, it certainly made it easier. Um, I mean, we have to sort of to put it in context. Remember that, um, you know, the idea of journalistic objectivity, that there's sort of a, you know, kind of a common set of facts that everybody is going to agree on and start the discussion from, you know, that's not something that was handed down on stone tablets. You know, that's a, a, a development in American journalism that happened, you know, toward the middle to the end of the 19th century. Um, and before that, the assumption was that every newspaper that you read was a partisan one that came from your own party uh, and presented the political world through that lens. Um, and now we are in some ways reverting back to that old uh, form, um, albeit with, you know, with still the existence of plenty of news organizations that do still want to uh, uphold the ideals of objectivity. Um, but it, it certainly has become a lot easier to kind of close yourself off um, if you only want to hear things that are from your side. Um, but there's also a question of you know, whether or not that really hurts you or not. Can you uh, get all the information that you need and make reasonable decisions and be an active citizen uh, without, you know, going to, say, read magazines from people whose opinions you find odious? Um, and uh, I think, you know, the answer is it depends. There's, there's a, an active debate going on in the blogosphere right now about the conservatives' uh, epistemic closure uh, and whether or not... Um, on the right, people are so kind of caught within their own the, their own worldview and their own sources of information that they're that they are having trouble seeing uh, the world as it actually is. But that's that actually I think is a product of the, of the particular the particular way that a lot of people on the right treat the mainstream media, where there's a, it's become an article of faith for a lot of people that that even places like like the Washington Post, the New York Times are you know, uh, enthralled to some kind of secret liberal agenda, and therefore nothing that they say can be trusted and everything can be discounted if it doesn't come from somebody with an avowedly conservative outlook. Um, I don't think you find that same kind of thing on the left. People on the left are still looking at those sort of mainstream sources, even if they're not reading the Weekly Standard and Red State and things like that. Um, so it's perfectly possible for a citizen to, to not listen too much to the opinions of people they don't like, because if you pay attention to the news media, the actual news media, not just commentary, you're going to hear a lot of them, whether you like it or not. You know, if you watch the evening news, you're going to get to hear what Republicans say and what Democrats say. Um, and so even if you're not going over into those places where you get a lot of the things from the other side, you should still be able to pick it up and at least have a conception of what they're talking about. I, um, the change, the big change is that where before if you wanted to read a newspaper you had one or two in your city. Um, before if you wanted to watch the television news you had three networks and a half hour newscast at the same time every day. Whereas now you have that or uh, 24 hour a day newscasts on at least three networks on my service now. There are, I don't know, six or seven including BBC and all sorts of other things. Uh, and of course the internet where you can access any newspaper, any magazine, anything, anytime. And those viewing habits are changing and people are sort of self-selecting into a lot, a lot of partisans into news that gives them their point of view back. I, don't, I wasn't sure if you mentioned the Kaiser question, um, John, or uh, I just jotted this. This was the, the sort of poll question of the last month that kind of blew me away. Because if you look at ratings, we tend to see rating data. So the, the audience size for any given hour on Fox News or CNN or MSNBC is still pretty low mm -hmm. as compared to the CBS Evening News, which even though it's a fraction of what, you know, or NBC or ABC, fraction of what they used to be, still outnumbers any given hour 
uh, by quite a bit. Kaiser Family Foundation does surveys, a monthly tracking survey about healthcare. And last month, they, the, this was like the second or third question on their survey, they asked, uh, have you gotten any information about the health reform law from, and then they went through a battery. And it, it was unusual. This is different than the way pollsters have asked this before. Choice one, cable TV news channels such as CNN, Fox, or NBC, or their websites. Second choice was broadcast network news channels such as ABC, NBC, CBS, or their websites. Newspapers or newspaper websites, and then there were five others. Conversations with family and friends, listening to the radio, other websites or blogs, elected officials, an employer, community organization. You could say yes to any one of those. So cable, 67. Broadcast or their websites, 60. Newspapers, 49. And some of the others, which, did you, which do you rely on most? Cable, 36, broadcast, 16, newspapers, 12. That means cable was bigger than newspapers or broadcast combined. And guess what? Huge partisan break on that. Uh, Republicans, by a margin of more than two to one, said cable. And they weren't saying Fox, but sure does seem like a lot of them were watching Fox. Democrats, uh, uh, more of a mix, but more reading newspapers and watching the networks. And you know, lo and behold, we're in an environment where there's more polarization of opinion on a whole host of, of attitudes. And I will, I will let my other panelists pick up the thread, but I think that is the, the, the difference. Well, I think that uh, the interesting thing is that when I talk to my students about popular culture, there seems to be a lot of agreement on things like American Idol. You know, and when it comes to popular culture, there seems to be a public opinion and everybody seems to be able to, you know, agree on something. But when it comes to politics, are, is there just so much information out there that people are overwhelmed and just cannot form opinions or they just form an opinion just to have one and don't think about it? I mean... <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think that... <clears throat> there's again it goes back to the beginning there's no single yeah. public opinion on any given issue um mark i'll refer again to his um website but I, he wrote some article of nine ways to poll stimulus or something it was yeah. like anyway right. we could have written about any subject in the right. past you know four years you know that just so take the take health care you know the lots of controversy over how to poll hundred ways to 1500 ways to ask it you know so i mean i think it's it because you can ask the same about the same issue in a variety of ways and get different answers does not make you know all of those different numbers irrelevant and not based on reality so take the individual mandate for example that is famous um in the in the healthcare legislation we, you know, we asked about it last june and when you asked straight up you know do you support or oppose a requirement whereby all individuals in the united states would be required to carry health insurance at that time it was something like a 49 47 proposition and then you ask you know subsequently well what if that included um fines on people who you know refuse to get it, well, support dropped to 44 percent. But what if it what if it included a requirement whereby all employers, you know, over a certain size, you know, offer health insurance? It went up to 68. You know, so people would ask, well, what is you know what is public support for the individual mandate? And you know, one of my responses was, well, do you want the 49? Do you want the 68? The 44? You know, and that doesn't that's not to dismiss the question. It's just they're all you know equally important, and it depends on you know kind of how the issues are framed. And this is why you know you know politicians and parties are doing so much polling themselves. They're you know out for message testing and what will work with the public. That's not our fundamental role. In fact, you know one of the reasons we poll is because they do. And you know we want to we want to show you you know kind of what the American public is thinking and not just have it all through these you know kind of more partisan forces and lenses out there that are you know kind of out to do that you know we release all the questions we ask unlike you know people who do message testing and may you know ask it four different ways and only release the one question and data point that is most in their group's favor you know so there's all you know kind of these games being played when people you know present data to the public you know we ask the question. People are free and um, genuinely do um, criticize um, the way we ask things. You know, Frank, uh, it's reassuring that that happens uh, about equally from the right and the left. Um, it means we're getting some right on some issues where it's all criticism one way or the other. Um, but I mean, I think that so there's not a single you know issue here. It's just kind of you ask it in a variety of ways, and you you try to you know extract some learning from that and understand the you know healthcare debate better in the case of you know asking 
about the individual mandate five different ways and getting five different answers wasn't meant to confuse, but you know, to actually elucidate what's going on and you know, always bring the question back to you know, kind of how people feel about their doctors, their own coverage, their own costs, and you know, kind of look at all that into context and you know, try to inform the debate. That's you end up fracturing people. You turn off independent. It's like having a lump of uh, Play-Doh or something. You squish it in the middle. You, you're suppressing the independence and you're driving up the people on the outside um, who become more hyperactive, I guess, in the political arena um, in both elections and demonstrations and things like that. And it just turns off the independence and then it just feeds itself. It's a cycle. Um, and it's not just polling. I think that happens with all major news stories as well. Um, I think, uh, but it's not all media outlets. Uh, if I just relate it to one, one thing you said before, I mean, I, I mean, I think that um, criticism is sometimes justified. Um, and, but it's kind of, t you take the long view and one of the limitations we have in analyzing polls is, you know, kind of high quality polls haven't existed for all that long. I mean, you know, we're talking about, you know, the mid thirties when, you know, Gallup gets going and the Washington Post was actually the first subscriber to the Gallup poll. But people talk about historic distrust in government, you know, and I always say, well, what was it during the whiskey rebellion? You know, like we just, you know, they're, they're, we're, we're fundamentally limited in what we're looking at. And I think that we oftentimes, just to extend that point, you know, kind of don't take the long view and understand how this fits in the context of other things. I, I, I think the uh, president joked about this at, for the, at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. It was, I think there was a whole riff on what would, it, what would have been like if the Politico had existed um, in, you know, during the revolution. And 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 they they, they 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 one of the things I'm probably get it wrong was like no bounce what? right right no something no like constitution that. no bounce something but it was like it was it was um you know they had a dateline July third seventeen seventy six you know Whig representative says you know no deal independence, independence is off um, <laughs> you know something like that so I mean, I, I think I think you know to to bring it back to the media environment it's kind of there's a lot of hyperventilation now um, and you know kind of. What you know, we try to do with polls, although sometimes polls amplify that <laughs> hyperventilation, is to pull back and put it into context, and then we're just limited somewhat in what we can say. And I, I think, uh, just real quick, I think it's TV more than it's it's print because they have it's cable news, especially they have a lot of air time to fill. So um, hyperventilating is really their last recourse when uh, on slow news days when. Uh, Wolf Blitzer has to fill up six hours in the Situation Room. With yeah, and also, um, if I could add to that, one, one of the things that <clears throat> the the problems with how the public gets this stuff uh, is that you know people like John who who understand uh, who have you know methodologically methodologically sophisticated methods and understand what the what the the data that they get really can tell you and can't tell you and appreciate all this ambiguity that's there. You know they pass it off and then it sort of gets circulated around. Um, uh, Sam says particularly on television where you know you'll see during a campaign that that the the networks will run tracking polls and they'll say well you know. Obama is up two points from yesterday, and that must be because the public is, uh, you know, upset about that that thing that he said uh, the day before yesterday. Well, no, it's not. You know, that's just a sort of random fluctuation. Any more than you know, Jim Cramer can tell you why the Dow went up two points today. Um, you know, you impose these kind of explanations on things to make sense of it, but actually, uh, you know, those people might as well be reading tea leaves um, or the entrails of the sheep they just slaughtered. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so I, I'm sure that's very frustrating to you. It's, and, it, and it's not, you know, it's not, and the problem is not like, like the, the big article that's in the post about the poll that they did, um, because that I'm, you know, is done with your cooperation. And I'm sure that, you know, you can flag anything that the, and the, and the reporters know who, who write that piece know a little more about it um, than, you know, the person who's the, the anchor on CNN at one in the afternoon. Um, yes. But that just then contributes to this idea that's very common among the public is that, you know, polls are just, you know, everybody has their own polls and, and you know, figures don't lie, but liars can figure and none of it means anything. And you can, you know, you can manipulate those numbers however you want to. But I, but I think, do you think the public really thinks that? I think that the public really looks at the polls. I mean, I think that during the election, you know, polls were all over the place. And you brought up some really interesting points. I mean, do we need, as the public, to become sort of poll literate? Do we need to understand, you know, that there's a margin of error and that goes up, you know, up or down three points? And I, for, for me, I think the first, the first thing would be just to get the reporters as a starting point to be poll literate. That would be, go a big way. So that, so that you know, even just the, the very idea of a margin of error and what it means and what kind of a number you can say is meaningful and what kind of a number you can say is, you shouldn't say is meaningful, that would be a good start. Um, 
and you know, it would be great if the public was poll literate, but you know, meanwhile, they are, you also need them to get like scientifically literate, and there's a, ten different ways the literate. public ought to be more literate. So, you know, it's yeah, big man the climb. I said, yeah, I was going to joke and say that reading of my website should be mandatory, and everyone should have to buy a subscription that will sell or something. Um, but I'm not holding my breath waiting for that to happen. Uh, but I agree, if, if, we, if we could get uh, cable TV producers to be just a tad more um, literate, although they are up against. Uh, a problem. I mean, if you've got a daily tracking poll every day on presidential, pro two of them actually, uh, depending on which network you work at, but there are two available, um, and there are usually three or four released national polls every week, at least, and they usually tend to come in waves. Well, okay, you know, those of you who know something about numbers know, well, a point or two doesn't really matter all that much, but you know what? There's a bell curve. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? So one poll out of every 20 or 25 is really out there for no reason at all. That's just the way the random ball bounces. It is what we like to call an outlier. And I guarantee you, every single time, the outlier is the story. If there are 10 polls with no story and one that's just a little wacky, that's the one that everybody's talking about on cable news for 24 hours until another one comes along and then we're, we're off of it. I just want to say one thing to our students. I know we cover this in research and writing methods, and I know everybody thinks that class is boring and hates it, but we do cover the bell curve, and we do talk about margin of error and standard deviations and all of those things. So there is reason for that. So um, I, I'm also kind of I'm also kind of curious. You know, we talk about polls um, and and the fractious public right now. What do you think is the gold standard for polling? I mean, what what is it that I know? <laughs> I mean, what is it? What makes a good poll? And how do we know if if we're if we're reading it? How, you know, how do we know when we look at a poll besides the name? You know, Gallup or Washington Post or something. Uh, well, I I, I I think you shouldn't look at the name at all. I mean, I mean, you can only as an indicator, you know, of what's underneath the hood. Um, so to speak. I mean, for you know us and others, it's it's all about methodology. It's all about you know how the polls are conducted. And essentially, nothing else matters. It's not about a famous name. It's not about you know kind of being right in some you know past election. It's about you know kind of how you conduct your polls because fundamentally, that's all you know. All these are are you know ideally random samples you know of of the public and that's how you you can you can claim it as public opinion when you're done with it you know the the gold standard um in my view and others here may disagree i know others outside disagree um is still you know kind of calling people um on their home telephones you know using random digit dial which has been you know the methodology has been you know kind of the this gold standard you know for 30 years it's been augmented in most um media polls uh, by cell phones because you know cell, cell phone only households now represent about um, two in ten adults in the United States you know excluding them although it's although you can pretty much you can pretty well show that it doesn't make a darn difference in the results it's a large enough um, segment of the population to exclude it doesn't make a lot big difference for politics and other areas um, I think you know quite reasonably it would but you know we include um, cell phone interviews with every poll we do and augment that random digit dial um, sample you know others do it differently there's certainly that if that's the gold um, standard I certainly admit um, to its being tarnished at the moment response rates have declined for anyone you know kind of who's been following this for a long time it's harder to get people on the phone there's technology that makes it easier to ignore us um, but you know when we when someone answers the phone and they and they hear it's a legitimate source, or they think it's a legitimate source, or it's a source that they just want to express their opinion to, um, we find that people are willing, um, still willing to cooperate with interviews. Cooperation rates um, remain, you know, where they've been for the past, you know, several years, not as high as we'd like. But, you know, we, we work hard to get a good sample because that's, you know, we are nothing other than that. This is probably, I mean, this is the question that's closest to, you know, what I do. And it's, both hugely important and hard. Um, hard because the, the world of survey research, uh, to the extent that there was a consensus about what the gold standard was, uh, when I came into the field, uh, it has been unraveling, and there isn't one now. Um, there are different schools of thought, um, but they bump up against problems. So there's, you know, uh, John uh, speaks eloquently of one uh, school of thought that says you you try to 
Um, you know, you start with a what we call a probability sample, a random sample of some kind, and you try as hard as you can to get every element of that sample, but it's bumping up against all these limits that not everybody has a landline phone. Most people don't answer the ringing phone or don't stay on it very long if they hear a voice they don't know or they, uh, or, you know, and whatnot. Uh, there's another school of thought that really succeeded wildly on the internet in 2008. And that was uh, uh, personified by Nate Silver in 538. And it was the notion that, well, all we got to do is wait by accuracy. And whoosh, it's all better. We don't have to worry about that stuff. And if you look at, quote unquote, accuracy, the, the surveys that break all the rules that John and his colleagues feel so strongly about enforcing are either as accurate or most accurate, depending on who you ask. Um, I'm not convinced that either camp here has a sort of monopoly on the gold standard. I think that uh, we need to just understand as consumers of this, particularly those of us who are in the news media and have some responsibility to do this right, uh, that, that we're in a period of evolution. In Great Britain, they're having an election on Thursday. Fascinating to me that uh, uh, 1992, using gold standard methods. They were doing door-to-door -door interviewing. All the pollsters missed the election. Um, and they had, you know, it was sort of like a 1948 like meltdown. They had it all wrong. And, and it's fairly, well, there's some debate over exactly why. Uh, but it was either that there was some bias in the sample or some bias in the measurement, what people were telling the pollsters. There may have been some people, you know, conservative voters who were shy about expressing their real opinion. But over that last 18 years, UK pollsters have gone through all sorts of, uh, introduced all sorts of new methods. I won't bore you with them. that differ from what my American colleagues do um, to try to correct this. And they find they do a random digit dial sample. They use a live interviewer. They call a, a population that's 85% landline phone. They wait by demographics. They have a consistent bias towards the Labor Party in their surveys that they try to correct. And we need to be aware that those kinds of things can happen here, too. There's nothing magical about being an American pollster that makes you immune to, you know, these kinds of problems. Yeah, I would add to that. Um, it is tough. Uh, you know, we fight every day to try new things, try new methodologies, to realize that there's not one answer. There's not one. I don't. There's not a gold standard anymore. I would say. Um, I mean, there's the telephone, but there's also. IVR, which is automated telephone, which Scott Rasmussen and some others used, is the internet. Um, right now, you have internet penetration rates that are as high, if not higher, than landline telephone. Uh, and you have to imagine that as the rates go this way, that the future is shifting. And so, you know, when, when you look at polls, uh, ours or anyone else's, um, even more than methodology or mode, I would just look at at the questions themselves and um, there's some they're good questions and they're bad questions we've all written bad questions we've all written good questions usually the bad questions are the ones that get on the news <laughs> um, you know uh, they don't tend to report on the good ones but the, I see a lot of people get caught up in horse races and, and tracking you know who's ahead today it's a game you know Democrats are up a little bit today the whole you know they're up two points and then they drop two it's a big story um, or Obama, McCain, or whatever it was. But I, I think the more interesting stuff that I've worked on, both for the media, for clients, has been issue-based polling. Um, we had a great series with UPI, United Press, uh, before they kind of disappeared off the face of the earth about two years ago, where they would, they were great. They, um, they would let us ask 50, 60 questions a month on one particular policy topic they didn't care what what it was they just left it up to us and they and they wanted to run it and we could get in you know 50 60 questions you can get in real detail on something you know like the arab israeli conflict you can start teasing out where the differences are but the problem is you find an audience that isn't too interested in reading deep down below whatever the shock headline is you know um but there was a lot of good stuff in there and uh, dr james zogby who's my boss's brother runs the Arab American Institute, went on to use a lot of it with uh, um, the J, uh, J Street, I think, and a couple of other 
um, groups that were trying to work out some consensus on U.S. solutions to Mideast peace, and, you know, I saw a lot of good in that. But I think it comes down to the, the questions and who's sponsoring the poll. I mean, sometimes we do work for clients, sometimes we just do it on our own. Um, and, and what's behind it as much as the particular methodology. <clears throat> Um, just want, want to add um, one thing. I'll preview something I've probably been meaning to talk to Mark about for a long time. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think I think the, I mean, totally agree on the issue. Things are much more interesting. I mean, in a way, the horse race is you know kind of the the most silly thing we do. We, we actually call it the silly season when we get really close to an election. There's you know polls all the time and things are whizzing around and you have outliers and you have all kinds of different things and you're just trying to make sense of it for yourself and you know whatever readership or audience you have. Um, but I think the next you know kind of big divide um, in the polling world will come between separating election you know type polls and the issue type polls. And I think you know because you know the uh, the getting an election right obviously is is important. Um, in some circles, and it's how you know pollsters communicate their accuracy um, to you know people who pay attention to that stuff. But you know there is a more seriousness of there's more serious purpose, and I think that's understanding. To go back to your original question, what public opinion is? It's not fundamentally a game to be right. You know, in the end, on an election, it's you know a to understand you know what campaigns are about and why voters vote the way they are. So there's an important part of even horse race polling, but you know, kind of even more fundamentally, it's like you know, what kind of healthcare system does the American public want, and what are the intricacies there, and what are the you know really real conflicts. And I and I do think that you know, kind of in the horse race, you know area of polling you don't you don't really sometimes you don't even need to create, do a poll at all and you know there's the, you can just model you know past elections and extrapolate them to the to now and you know you, you don't you don't need to do it so you can just you know have have a spreadsheet and you know calculate a number and put your name on it and that's as good as some of these polls out there but there it is far more serious to say what uh, people think about healthcare, what they think about the environment, um, what they think about immigration, and I, I think that that requires a um, level of seriousness and attention to um, methodological detail um, that's above what we've, as a profession, have put onto election polls. Can I just add something? It's especially for those of you who are uh, about to embark on career in, in the news media and communications. Um, everything Sam and John said is true, I think. Uh, the, the, in the sense that, I mean, I agree that the measurement of, uh, you know, issue polling and going into depth on issues has far more substance. I mean, it, to get at your initial question about, you know, what is public opinion and what do Americans want on public policy issues, uh, horse race questions don't get you there. But your audience, uh, particularly the ones who care about politics, for them, the horse race question on the poll is, is analogous to the World Series compared to spring training. It's the game that everybody watches, even if they're not really baseball fans, uh, or the Super Bowl, you know, compared to the, the games. It, it's, uh, we, we see what happens to our traffic. One of the reasons we run a website um, that, that obsesses about horse race polling is that that's what you know. We can we can get this huge audience two months every twenty two every uh, twenty four, um, and we have them for a minute uh, or two. And we can maybe you know when we put our serious hats on, they can learn something while they're looking at us, uh, and put things into context. Um, and I think to to sort of uh, you know hope that people will stop playing the game of trying to see who's ahead or behind. They won't. They're going to look at box scores. Uh, and I think as journalists, the real trick is to figure out how to write about this thing that interests people without it just being about tactics. You know, how to, how to help people understand the issues that the candidates are debating about, even though a lot of them are being drawn to figure out, well, what's the tactical move or the, mm -hmm. the strategy behind this particular message or that. Right. Oh, I, I mean, my um, admission against you know, following the horse race doesn't survive my leaving my front door um, <laughs> every morning. So it, this first question uh, my fiance asks me all the time, just who's winning? And then that's, that's the be all and end all. So I try to extrapolate from that into something else. Um, I wanted to, speaking of horse races and, and such, I wanted to sort of switch gears a little bit and talk about the upcoming horse race, uh, the 2010 election. I'm kind of curious as to what, what you're seeing on, uh, on the uh, 
now that we know there's no public opinion, what you're seeing on the no public opinion landscape, <laughs> you know, what 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 is polling showing us re regarding the parties, regarding what people care about? I mean, if you could give us a 30 second synopsis of what's going on based on your polling, what would you tell us? Just 30 seconds? I need well, more. You can um, take more than 30 seconds. Um, well, all right. It, it, the, let me let me not dodge the, uh, the the singular public opinion aspect of the question either. I, I think right now the political environment is favorable to the Republicans and really hostile to the Democrats. I'm not I don't think I'm telling you all anything you haven't heard. Um, I think that's the function of a of a of a bunch of things. Um, on the one hand, midterm elections put aside the recession, put aside health care debate, put aside all of that. If it's just some placid times. The kinds of voters who vote in midterm elections are disproportionately lower on the constituencies where Barack Obama did best. So younger voters, um, uh, non-white voters uh, that, that favored Obama by huge margins tend to turn out less in midterm elections. It's always been that way. That's one. <laughs> Two, multiple opinions. There is this huge sort of intensity and enthusiasm gap. Republicans. Uh, for whatever reason, maybe it has something to do with the way they've been getting their news, partly because there's a Democratic president, a Democratic Congress making changes the Democrats favor, are angry, really angry, um, feeling, uh, well, I mean, how many other synonyms for angry can I throw out? <laughs> Whereas Democrats are not, you know, they were angry two and four years ago, and that enthusiasm gap is flipped. Third, independence. Uh, people who are more in the middle, and I, and I think that the, the size of the independent group tends to get exaggerated, but those who aren't really rooted into the, the political debate are just worried. The economy is bad, doesn't seem to be getting better, the government's spending a whole lot of money on a lot of things, or at least that's the perception, and they don't see any of it coming to them. So that combination of things is bad for Democrats. I'll throw out the one other thing, which is sort of, you know, you would toss questions to us, what are you seeing now that's sort of most interesting? Um, there's a new survey out tonight, CBS New York Times, that is starting to pick up uh, evidence that people are sensing an improving economy. Um, not huge. And it's one survey, and you know we need to look at a lot of them. But the percentage who said that the economy is getting better jumped eight points in the last three months, I think. It was since January. Um, Obama's job approval on economy was a little higher. That I, I say that as a tentative sort of the be you know maybe that is the beginning of the trend if if perceptions of the economy move up in a significant way and that's the beginning of a, like a five month trend then that political environment could look uh, not quite so hostile to democrats not quite so favorable to republicans in the fall i would just um ask us to remember how dramatically things changed just last year between may and november you know, in, in May of last year, Obama was, you know, coming off of his 100-day mark um, you know, just a month prior. Um, in office, his approval rating, I think, was about 15 points higher, at least in our polls, um, than it is now. I'm sure that's um, true if you, if you look at the averages, um, you know, that Mark has. You know, things changed dramatically as the health care debate, you know, uh, picked up steam, uh, it, you know, from June all the way, you know, through its passage. Things have gotten marginally better for Obama and the Democrats on a number of um, um, dimensions in our poll that we put out last week, Obama's rating on the economy and on health care kind of had dipped below majority disapproval. It had it had kind of hovered, you know, kind of in the low 50s in terms of the percentage of Americans who disapprove of how he's handling those two marquee domestic issues. And, you know, kind of that got marginally better for him. He also had um, double-digit leads over the Republicans in Congress on handling the economy, on handling health care and some other issues. And that was also, again, a marginal improvement uh, over a couple months before. And make sense of them. I think regardless of, you know, kind of if the Tea Party, such as it is, you know, the uh, kind of a, a variety of groups and people that form it um, exists a year from now or two, a, or two years from now, it's worth studying for exactly the reason Mark mentioned. I mean, we're talking about the base of the Republican Party. And we did a whole series um, last fall called The Elephant in the Room, which was about, you know, kind of the, the major divides within the Republican Party. And we did a poll just just, you know, among Republicans to really look at these things. And we focused at that time 
on the differences between, you know, kind of the shrinking liberal and moderate um, wing of the party and conservatives. But the but the you know far bigger differences were between conservatives and very conservative, um, you know, Republicans and Republican leaners. And so that's 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 a divide. It was worth studying in the fall before we had the name Tea Party, and I think it's worth studying now. I think you know, kind of, we do have a tendency, we being the broader um, media, to exaggerate. You know these kinds of things when we do put the name on them and kind of you know explaining that they may or mean may not be different from the general public, I think is inc- you know entirely irrelevant to the in- uh, to the what's interesting about them is kind of what it means for um, Republicans and Republican motivation within the Republican Party and that's what we need to focus on not to kind of you know either isolate it as a you know kind of a well defined and delineated movement because it's not. I, I would agree completely. It's not a delineated movement. I've seen our numbers and some others about it. And when you look inside, it's, I mean, they're all over the place. Um, it's very easy to be united against uh, someone like uh, Barack Obama, um, a figure like that. But as soon as you start digging into why all these people are there, it's the same as if you went to a George Bush rally four or five years ago. You've got your anti war people, you've got your choice people, you've got your environmental people, and they're just all. They were, they were somewhat fractured, and Obama found a way to unite most of them uh, behind him. Um, but they're definitely, they definitely have a role to play. I mean, you've already seen what they've done in Florida, um, which is no small thing. They knocked one of the most popular governors, uh, at least at one time recently, out of, out of his own primary. Um, I think their importance is going to be tailored to specific states and specific races. I know that it'll be national. In some areas, they're going to have a huge impact, you know. The the Rand Paul's in Kentucky, although, I mean, he's not um, a Tea Party person necessarily. I don't think he's aligned with them. But um, in some of these primaries, and the Republicans are going to have to deal with this. I mean, they're going to have to figure out, once they get past the primary, how they incorporate that into their base and still manage to not turn off a lot of independents. Um, the, The Tea Party numbers I've seen seem to indicate that these people could easily be turned off if their particular candidate uh, decides to go a little, you know, start turned to the middle like they normally would in a general election. And if that's the case, then they very well might go and, I don't know, write in someone, vote for a third party, vote for a libertarian. There's no telling. And Democrats maybe even have a chance to pick up some of them if they can tap into this anti-Wall Street sentiment with some bank regulation or something like that. I, I don't know. Um, they're very... Uh, what did you say, fractitious bunch? Was that the... Uh, um, fractious. Works. Fractious. Fractious, <laughs> sorry. Um, fictitious. Fictitious, <laughs> fictitious <laughs> and fractious. Uh, fractious and fictitious. Um, um, I wanted to save uh, a little bit of time. It's, it, it's, uh, we have about 10, 15 minutes maybe for questions from the audience or anything that I didn't ask or anything that anybody wants to ask of our panel while we've got them here. Um, I'll come out and if you want to uh, ask a question, please just line up and we'll, uh, we'll take your questions and see what the panel has to say. Hi, my name is Marisha Sherry and I graduated from the program last year and I work for Agence France Press now. And I heard a lot of what you had to say about how polls are misreported, misrepresented, but could you maybe give us a sense of the ideal way to report a poll or what you want most to see? And obviously we're not gonna give tons and tons of fine print in what we say in our articles, but um, what are maybe the key things that should be included in order to help the public better understand the poll? All the things will make it sound less interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say um, I've I've seen both sides where uh, reporters call up and ask for you know some additional information or you know they they just want to talk about it, get a comment or whatever uh, from myself, from John, from whoever, um, and just being able to talk them through it a lot of times not necessarily to point them in a particular direction, but to kind of explain. It, there's a rationale that goes behind any poll, any major poll. I mean, some polls are just the horse race and two, three questions. Some polls are, are much longer. And if, if you have a lot of information there, there's usually a reason why 
a pollster put in 30 or 40 questions, why most of those questions are there. Um, and to, to talk to whoever it is, call them up and, and, and actually try to figure out what, what's going on behind uh, that you might not catch by just reading a press release or by reading a link from a website or something like that. That would be my biggest suggestion because the reporters I know who have done that, I, I tend to maybe agree more, not agree with, but uh, appreciate the, the work they've done and, and the way they've presented the data as opposed to some who maybe just take it and run with it. Um, yeah, do, do a little digging into it. That's I would demand uh, why. You know, I mean, I think that and, you know, ideally write a little longer, even though, you know, our tendency is to, you know, kind of just look for little little tidbits. But I, I think that, you know, kind of if, you know, if organizations that report, well, healthcare is now at 42 percent approval. Now it's 52 percent approval. Now it's 62. It's, like, it's, it's just mind numbing and, you know, kind of not that helpful to understanding what's really going on. You can get some clicks. You can get things by just presenting that. But, you know, if there's a big change, you know, within the same poll, you know, over time, you know, look for reasons why and, you know, force the pollster or the analyst or the organization to explain. And, you know, ideally they've asked not just a single question and basing the rest on, you know, their own, um, you know, opinion, but have asked follow-up questions. And the follow-up questions are always, you know, really important. The Times CBS poll um, out tonight has a kind of root question on the Arizona immigration law and then asks five, you know, kind of interesting follow-up questions about what are the likely outcomes from the law in terms of, you know, its effect on um, the behavior of undocumented uh, people um, in Arizona and, you know, kind of its its impact um, or potential effect on law enforcement and budget, et cetera. Those, uh, like that's the interesting part. Not that 51% in this one poll find the law about right, because there's clearly not enough information in that one question to kind of you know be be so declarative um, in the answer. But there, you know, if you take that together with all these interesting follow-ups, I think that tells a much richer story. And that's the one that is too often untold when people are just looking for that one number, whether it's horse race or Arizona immigration or whatever. Uh, let me let me make three suggestions. I could probably spin off many more, but three. Um, invest a little bit of time uh, to, to know a little something about what random error is um, and what the margin of error is, because the, you know the, the most common mistake I see uh, involves people seeing changes that aren't necessary, where there isn't enough evidence to know that there's a change. One, two. Um, context, particularly if you're writing, if someone's given you a horse race story to write, um, you know, if there's the one shock poll, uh, are there others uh, at the same time period? Uh, and, you know, and be careful what you compare. Uh, be careful not to compare apples to oranges without, you know, a lot of fruit in the chart or whatever. Um, and third, particularly on these issue questions, understand that for a lot of respondents, they are reacting to the information they're hearing. You're not necessarily measuring a, a previously held opinion. It's true, it's true with health care, it's true with immigration, it's true with financial reform. Uh, we write these questions uh, as if we're writing for people on the subway to Capitol Hill who, who you know, really are versed in them. And so that is the reason you get polls all over the place on issues. And I'll add a fourth. There's a wonderful document uh, on the website of the National Council on Public Polls and on APOR called, I think it's 20 questions a journalist should ask, I think, written by my neighbor and um, the Palisades, Evans Witt, um, which is a great tool for journalists. And, and you should go check it out. Great. OK, great. My name is Harvey Nelson. I'm a retired Foreign Service officer. Go back to Walter Lippmann's time. Uh, we talk about the anger of these people in the uh, Tea Party movement. And I, heard, I listened. I made myself listen almost all day a couple of weeks ago on C-SPAN to the Southern Republican Leadership Conference. And they were all angry, I think, by your definition. But is there some underlying theme? That, that there is there a principal focus for their anger, or what is the reason for their anger? Are they upset simply because the, the, um, the economy That's has gone galley west, or is there, they're just all tied in knots about their knickers in a knot about abortion or, or, or gay marriage or something like that? Is there an underlying sort of unifying focus of their anger? That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I, I would, you know, in our, in our uh, you know, I, I'm not sure, this is, you made me think of it. I'll come to your question, but you know, 
two years ago, a lot of my liberal friends were pretty angry. Um, and liberals across the country were pretty angry. And there was a unifying force to their anger, and it was George Bush. I mean, the one thing they all agreed on was we, they just wanted Bush out. Um, I think that there's, you know, it's not quite as unified. It, clearly, Obama is the face of the anger. Um, but I think there is a lot of anger from a lot of different directions. And I think the fuel underneath it is, is less about a war, uh, which I think was what sort of lit the candle with Bush. But, you know, we have a deep recession, and it didn't just start in 2008. You know, we had this lack of income growth for a whole decade. And uh, the, the demographics, uh, you know, older, uh, more downscale, uh, are the people who've been most impacted by the changing economy and, and are not seeing their dollars go as farther. So, I mean, there is, a, there is real economic dislocation. Um, and then this sense of grievance uh, that comes from different places, depending on how partisan you are or what your information source is. Yeah, and that gets to maybe another thing that journalists should be careful careful of is assuming that, you know, when you have some number, 54 percent of people think X, of assuming that everybody in that 54 percent, you know, thinks exactly the same thing just because they gave the, you know, the same answer to what's probably a closed-ended question um, and thinks it for the same reasons. Uh, you know, there are, there are a whole kind of um, – seething body of uh, different kinds of grievances that are all caught up in there. And, you know, uh, like for one of the one of the questions that's been debated about the Tea Party movement is what sort of a role does race play? And how many people are just angry because they, they cannot accept the idea of an African-American president? Well, uh, it's very difficult to, to answer that question because, uh, you know, it's uh, it, it's not an easy thing that you can that you can pull accurately on. There are ways to try to do it, but it's but it's difficult to get at. Um, and so the answer is, well, for some people, yes, that's an important part of it. Um, there are some people who in there who, you know, are genuinely passionate about the budget deficit. Um, I suspect that that's probably a far smaller number than the people who actually talk about it because, you know, we had budget deficits for, uh, for many years before uh, we happened to get a Democrat in the White House. Um, and so, you know, it's uh, – I, there's no perfect answer because um, uh, also because there are a lot of people who even they couldn't tell you exactly what is the most important thing that that makes them so angry. You know, they probably have a sort of a, a template uh, that they've gotten in part from from Fox News since it's, it's had such a, an important role in, in promoting the Tea Parties and from the other people in this movement that they've had contact with that says like this, these are the top five reasons why we're here. But you know, if you could actually look into their minds, there might be 20 reasons, and it's this big jumbled mess, even if what they will articulate is something that, you know, is kind of almost a script that they've, that they've sort of signed on with. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's a, a very, very difficult, if not impossible, question to answer. Um, just to quickly add, the one thing that you know wasn't mentioned, I dismissed the the notion of distrust of government before, you know, just in terms of the long term context. But it plays a real role. You know, there is a anxiety about the size and growth of government um, that that has increased over the past year. There are you know more people angry about the federal government and the way it operates than at any point since '94, and that 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 is a real force and you know motivating a lot of this. And that has a lot to do with party too. When there's Democrat. Democrats are in power. Republicans get very distrustful of government, well, and when yeah, and the, asked, the other way around too. But but I mean, you're right. It's lower yeah. now. Than I mean, but it, I mean, Obama's government. the face, and we, so we asked, you know, last week in the in the poll we released, you know, kind of, do you in general prefer a you know smaller government with fewer services or larger with more? Fifty six percent of you know Americans said they prefer you know smaller government, and when we asked what did they think you know President Obama prefers, seventy seven percent said that he prefers a larger government. So you know, kind of, it, it, it's it's not only about this one issue, but that undergirds a lot of this. You know, you combine that with what Mark talked about the economic anxiety and you know, health care really was a stand in for the more general fear um, of government and, you know, kind of it hit at this, it hits people at home and their economic anxiety in a particular way, which, you know, made, you know, kind of some you know, those August, you know, uh, town hall rallies so forceful. Um, but I will just, I'll end by saying, um, you know, when we asked in August, you know, kind of if you're range from enthusiastic to angry about uh, proposed health care changes, there were nearly as many people who were enthusiastic as angry, and it gets to the media coverage that, you know, we focused uh, primarily on the angry. Okay. My name is Steve Underhill. I'm a PhD student at the University of Maryland in the communication program. Assuming that public opinion polling is interested in majorities, 
Do people in your profession make ethical considerations regarding minority rights, meaning the dangers of mobilizing a, uh, you know, a strong majority that would disregard the rights of a minority? Um, can, sorry, can you give me a for instance? I, I, I'm trying to think of what I've struggled with. And okay, for instance, I mean, here's a hypothetical. I'm going to make up the number. Okay. Uh, <laughs> soon after 9-11, if you found that 90% of people who responded said that they would favor neutralizing civil liberties for maybe Muslim Americans because, you know, there's a big suspicion, uh, that could obviously lead to problems when people recognize that there's this huge consensus against a, a minority faction. Hmm. What if you think the majority is wrong? Yeah. I mean, in, in some ways, our job is not to make judgments about the opinions, but to measure them mm -hmm. and to describe them accurately. I mean, I, I can answer it sort of in another way. I worked as a partisan for a long time. So I, I was, you know, I was on a side. I didn't have a, a moment's hesitation about what side I was on or how I felt and didn't mind saying it out loud. But within the campaign, that wasn't my job. My job was to measure reality. My job was to find out what people thought, not to shave it, not to alter it, not to express an opinion about it. In a lot of ways, it, it, it was not any different from what a, what a media, I mean, this is almost heretical to some of my friends in the media, but it's, it essentially was the same role um, within the campaign as media pollsters have to the public. It's to describe it straight. I would say, you know, so just to riff off that a little bit, you know, our job is not to create, you know, momentum for anything, but to measure it if it's there. So, for instance, um, before my time, so I can talk about, you know, the Post and actually ABC came under a lot of criticism for not asking uh, about impeachment. You know, there were many people who wanted to, or some number of people, I won't even say many, who wanted to and, and felt very strongly that um, George Bush should be impeached. The fact is there was never a real movement in the Congress where that such a move would have had to start, you know, to do this. And so asking the question was in a way, you know, kind of bringing about something or potentially bringing about something that wasn't happening. And so, I, I mean, I can't speak to exactly the reasons why, um, you know, we didn't ask more questions about it. It was before my time. But you know that, that that was that's an instance where I think you would really have to struggle with what your role is. You know, are you trying to create something on on Capitol Hill, which I you know think firmly the answer is no. You know, or react to a movement and gauge as best you can what the public thinks about what's going on. And also, your your question is sort of fundamentally about the uses to which public opinion is going to be put. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the things we've seen recently, especially, is that. Uh, Politicians on either side will will uh, look for the results that that are most favorable to their side and try to use that as a way of, of persuading each other and continuing to persuade the public that that this is where the majority is. I mean, during during health care, um, you know, Republicans kept saying that the, the the public is against this plan, the public is against this plan, and Democrats would come back and say, no, if you actually tell them what's in it, then they're for it. And they both, you know, they were both right. Um, but uh, you know, pollsters don't have much control over the fact that that politicians who are going to try to use their results uh, in whatever way they can to to gain advantage. And you know, to a certain extent, it's just cynical. They're just going to look for the thing that's most favorable to them. Um, but uh, you know, yes, uh, I suppose there are, there are going to be times when they're going to see in public opinion data some kind of a justification for the nefarious thing that they want to do. Um, but. You know, absent that data, uh, if they want to do it, they're probably going to do it anyway. So, okay. Yeah, one last question. Great, thanks. Um, my name is Randon Swindler. I'm a graduate from the University of South Carolina, and I kind of want to turn the tables. Um, obviously, all of us at some point or another have studied polling or journalistic studies. Um, as an average consumer, how do you go from being complacent to the numbers to really having that eye-catching, wow, that poll stands out? What makes a good poll as opposed to something that's just an everyday number? I mean, they come out every day. There's an overload of them. What makes it stand out? Well, let, let me uh, I'll say something I know John will agree with. I, I mean, I don't think it's the one number. Uh, I mean, sometimes I, there was an example. I pulled out a question at the beginning. I said, this really caught my eye because it was a very surprising finding to me. It was a question asked in a different way. That's kind of unusual. What I think is most 
impressive are the longer form surveys that really attack a complicated question from a lot of different angles that sort of, you know, triangulate, um, ask the same question a bunch of different ways and look at data thoroughly uh, to, to help understand something that's complicated. Right now, um, immigration is, we've had this sort of new thing happen. Uh, you know, John's example about CBS New York Times that's, that you can look at tomorrow morning or when you get home. Uh, you know, we've had this new law happen. So there's a new thing that some people have read about and others haven't that is going to be debated. And it puts a little different nuance on the, the immigration debate we had two years ago. And this is an opportunity which the pollsters at CBS New York Times took to ask a lot of different questions a lot of different ways. And it doesn't lend itself to one number. Because I'm not sure there is one. There's a there's a public that really watched, you know, that could right now today tell you all about the Arizona bill, what they like about it, and what they don't. And there are probably a bunch of people in the middle who've heard something about this. There's some new law. It sounds kind of uh, they're going to arrest people or something. And then there are a whole bunch of others who don't know a thing. And in between, there are lots of interesting, rich attitudes about what people think about immigrants and illegal immigrants and what the government's doing or not doing. Um, and the tapestry of all of that is, you know, is the, the, the many public opinions. I, I'm not to say I'm, I'm intrigued by, you know, kind of smart subject choices <laughs> and, and good timing and, you know, kind of the, the, the depth that's out there. Um, you know, I think the Times, you know, is the first, you know, I would say the first poll that's there. I, I, I can criticize them till the cows come home. Right? But, um, you know, but, but I mean, this is the first Charlotte real poll. Um, I've become a real partisan in terms of polling. But, um, you know, they, they, they ask a lot of the good questions about immigration. And that's, it's the, you know, Gallup had a single question, you know, that they put out last week and drove a lot two. of the coverage yeah. or right. two um, questions that drove a lot covered. of the coverage and, and, and did also get some criticism over the weekend for um, its thinness, although, you know, as accurate as two questions may be, it kind of didn't provide a depth. The Times is the first poll to do that. I think it was a smart choice to do. Um, I'll, you know, compliment another, you know, competitor. I thought what the Politico did um, on the mall uh, with the exit poll of Tea Partiers, um, uh, people who actually came, you know, Mark mentioned, you know, right. when, you, when you call people on the phone, they could, you know, they could be, you know, kind of the, the depth of their support may be um, rather shallow and kind of call them supporters is one thing versus actually going there. It's skewed for all the reasons you might expect, you know, picking one, you know, event on the mall to stand for a broader movement. But I thought it was, uh, it was an interesting um, endeavor. I thought it was smart for them to do. And I thought the results were interesting as circumspect as they are. And lastly, I'll just, you know, plug for something that we did that I thought was important at the time is, you know, the, the, we had the Massachusetts special election. There was no exit poll. You know, there were people just absolutely making up <laughs> what voters, you know, how, why voters voted the way they did on election day. That angered me <laughs> the day after the election. You know, I talked to a couple of our partners. We did a two night poll asking Massachusetts special election voters why they voted. We got those data out. And so the Sunday shows, you know, kind of the people who, the talking heads who go on the Sunday shows actually had to refer to, you know, albeit not perfect, but they had to refer to good data in making um, their claims about what the voters of Massachusetts wanted. And so it was just kind of, it was a, um, you know, it was something that we did that I thought was a service. Pew did a service, you know, two weeks ago doing this distrust in government um, thing where it just picked a smart topic and did it well. So it's less based on the numbers and maybe more based on the question? I mean, when, when I'm writing up polls, obviously, you know, I, the, the numbers help. You know, kind of a big change over time right. or, you know, something that stands out or a, a you know, a seeming contradiction um, in public opinion that everyone likes to point out that is actually, you know, ex, you know, you can actually explain it if you look at three other questions. And so, you know, kind of, you know, I look at, you know, smart questions, smart analysis and timing and, you know, not you know, whether someone's at 54 or 52 and, you know, whatnot. Okay, well, we certainly have a lot to think about concerning the opinions, what makes opinion, what influences opinion, who has an opinion, who has an opinion about something they don't really know, <laughs> but still has an opinion. Um, I'd like to thank our panel. I did promise them I'd get them out by 9.30, so I'd really like to thank them for staying and um, sort of giving us the inside scoop on a lot of this. Thank you very much. And we still have a lot of goodies outside, so please.